Hello, I'm Jay Hershenson, Vice Chancellor for University Relations of the City University of New York. We are here on the set of Herman Badillo's Education Forum. For more than two years, prominent officials and activists joined with Mr. Badillo to discuss the educational challenges before us all. Through Education Forum, the CUNY TV audience gained access to key movers and shakers in a crisp, often scintillating format. Herman recently resigned as chairman and as a member of the CUNY Board of Trustees. We are very pleased to present these highlights from several shows with our deep gratitude for his service to CUNY TV and the university. It has been said, with respect to the black and Hispanic community, that the average 17-year-old Hispanic or black uh, performs at reading, writing, and arithmetic at the average of the 13-year-old white kid. And that, of course, that disparity is uh, quite serious. Well, when, whenever there is a dual standard, one high and one low, it is always true that that lower standard is the one that the child of color will be asked to observe, whether that child is, is African American or Latino or whatever. The, that puts that child at a tremendous disadvantage. And what I would hope would be that the leadership of the African American and Hispanic communities would come to realize that the future of their children requires that everyone advocate for a higher standard because when those children get out into the marketplace, whether it's in academia or whether it's in a job setting, no one's going to, no one's going to give them a lower level at which to operate. They're going to be obliged to operate at the same level as everybody else. Expectation raises the effort and by the way, the young people have some responsibility for themselves. I mean, as we go through these conversations, one of the things I'm struck by is the fact that almost invariably nobody talks about the student's responsibility to himself or herself. They have a role to play as well. And they will respond to higher expectations. We're seeing that happening already. I mean, people said, you ask young people to pass that English Regents, they will never do it. Well, 93% of the children in this state have done it. What about uh, the parents? How are they doing? I think the parents are doing less well. I, I'm much more confident in the response of the, of the young people than I'm in the response of the adults. If, if my, one way to characterize my book is that it's very critical of the educational theorist and the educational theorists who were ensconced in the great institutions of, let's say, the pedagogical institutions, had theories about who should be educated and who should not be educated. Uh, some of them had theories about how to reform society. Uh, my own view is the way you reform society is one child at a time. And you do this by educating everybody in the very best way you know how. Uh, the educational theorist, however, saw social reform in a variety of ways. One was, let's prepare some children, a few for college and the others for jobs. And so th we had, for example, the industrial education movement in the beginning of the century. And they were marking children at the age of 10, 11, and 12 and saying, these are the children sh that should be prepared for factory work. Now, how did you know who is, should be prepared for factory work? Well, what did their parents do? They were factory workers mm -hmm. or farm workers, so the children should be given the same kind of occupational training. But that was justified as a progressive step. This, this right? was considered very progressive because, uh, because the theorists didn't like an academic education. They thought academic, in their mind, was a very negative term. Um, in my mind, and this is what I emphasize through the book, an academic education is the education that we give to elites. And the great promise of American education is that we would give the elite education to everybody and not just to the children of the well-born and children of bankers and, and uh, professionals. Well, unfortunately, that uh, theory that academic education uh, is uh, left to a certain group uh, today is a prevalent idea, according to uh, John McWhorter, uh, his book, uh, Losing the Race, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you read, indicates that uh, uh, this is a feeling that exists uh, among many black and Latino groups. 
Well, you know, I, I, I've traveled uh, in different parts of the country talking about the book and trying to explain how, what are the ideas, you know, that, that, that we swim in? What is the context in which we come up with different education reforms? And so as I explain this fundamental idea of tracking, of saying this is the elite, the elite gets the elite education, and then the 80% or the 70% will get something watered down, so many people call in, especially in these call-in shows, and they say, that's what happened to me. I was told in seventh grade that I should be a secretary, mm -hmm. and it was only later that I discovered that I really could learn how to read. I really could, I really had the potential for a college education. Mm -hmm. And so many people discovered too, too late or, or later in life, and I think it's one of the wonderful aspects of our higher education system that we don't close the door and that we give people endless second chances to say, yes, I want to do this work and I can make my life different. Listen, that almost happened to me because in high school, uh, I was, uh, I couldn't speak English very well because I came here when I was 12 and um, from Puerto Rico, but I was put into a, a class uh, for airplane mechanics, vocational course. And mm -hmm. fortunately, I, I was able to transfer to the academic uh, diploma just in time, just barely in time. Otherwise, I would now be unemployable because uh, because uh, what you learned not that is many not jobs in airplane right. mechanics. The other problem that we have in common is teacher training, because we train most of the teachers for the Board of Education, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, a lot of them are not too good. So we are improving our programs at CUNY, and uh, well, you find that. Uh, you need to improve the quality of your teachers, right? You're, you're, again, you're, you're being kind. We have a terribly serious problem on yeah. teacher quality, and you know that, and we both know that is the most important issue in education today. I mean, if you had to, if you had to scrap all these great programs and just focus on one thing, it's teacher education, teacher training, and teacher professional development. There's no getting away from it. And what's interesting is the governor's on board, uh, the union's on board, uh, certainly all the educators are on board. Uh, we're all focused on professional development, and that's critical. Um, so I, I think what we need to do in terms of the city university and us is I know that uh, Matt's talking about bringing all of that together under a unified roof. And I that's think right, that's because, because we have a very good record at some of the colleges, mm -hmm. but a terrible record at some of the others where the teachers who get a uh, degree in education can't even pass the teachers examine English, and that has to stop. And, and we know that how you score on the NCATE exam and how you do as an undergraduate determines how well right. your kids exactly. are going to do right. mm -hmm. on their exams. Well, with that piece of knowledge, I've made the conscious decision I'm going to start looking elsewhere, too. I've, I've gone to SUNY. I've met with all the private colleges in the state of New York. The irony here is that New York State is a net exporter of teachers. I need those teachers, and I want the best. We deserve the best in New York City, and I'm going to get them. Well, Randy Weingarten was here some time ago, and she's very pessimistic about the system's ability to come up with what she says is something like 54,000 teachers in the next few years. Do you think it can be done? We don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. We will get it done for the simple reason we're not going to have empty classrooms. I mean, part of this is a supply and demand issue. And part of this is also working out the teacher rules. The supply and demand issue is we need to pay up to have comparable wages so that people don't get drawn off to the suburbs. Uh, right now, we're underpaying our teachers by thousands of dollars, and that's got to stop. On the other hand, I need to have the freedom to assign teachers in an effective way so as to maintain class size and be able to get flexibility. Those two things go hand in glove. And I found when I was uh, congressman and president of the Bronx that the problem is that we rely upon the Board of Education to reach out to the parents. And I don't think the Board of Education really has the resources to do that. No, we rely on the Board of Ed not just to do that. We rely on teachers and the board to be social workers, yeah, health care providers, it. and everything else. And they're there to teach and educate our children. And it's the role of the community to make sure parents aren't involved. 
uh, that we put systems in place to engage parents into the educational system itself, uh, making sure that information is disseminated to them on a regular basis, making sure, as we talked about earlier, school leadership teams are in place so people know the law and are fully participant in what the law is about. I don't think the Board of Education can do all of that. I think the Board of Education is a big enough problem just making sure they have the teachers in the classroom and they provide the teaching. I think that we need a separate organization to reach out to the parents. Uh, when you say a separate organization, oh, you mean like Kerman Kerman Lee. Well, I think so. the board has started to see that wisdom. I mean, with more of their services being contracted out to CBOs, community-based organizations, and other types of organizations, so it's not on their shoulders and then mm -hmm. monitoring that, whether it's the New York Urban League, whether it's a SPIRA, whether it's other groups and communities, faith-based institutions throughout the city, so that way there's a partnership. Let's look at a district that's always been a high performing district, District 26. And what you'll see probably with a District 26 is a full community, including parents, local businesses, corporations, politicians, all involved in working with the district to make sure students are learning at a very high level. I think we need to model that throughout all the local districts. You know, teenagers in particular are very intolerant of difference. So if you're a, diff a little different from what they think the norm is, they tend to really brutalize you. And, and uh, it can get to kids. And I think part of what we have to do is teach them that different is not necessarily bad. Different can be very good and enriches all of us. And you know, the, the stereotype of everybody dressing the same way, talking the same way, thinking the same way, is not necessarily the only way to be. Uh, but it is a serious problem. And you see it in the, you know, this, this smaller child, this more, the smaller teenager, the one that develops uh, a little slower than the rest, or the young girl that doesn't quite look like the rest of the girls because she's a little thinner, a little fatter. Uh, get, they, they can be very cruel. And well, there's also um, the problem of the accent. I know I went oh, through it because yeah. if you sure. mispronounce words, which of course you have to if you can't speak the language, then everybody laughs, and that, that yeah. can get you very upset. Well, and they also equate accent with being dumb, mm -hmm. so, so that if you have an accent, everybody sort of, I, I, I've always felt that it lowers your IQ about 15 or 20 points <laughs> just mm -hmm. by virtue of the accent, so then you have to prove yourself uh, that much more. Also, you know, there are a lot of teenagers who come from foreign countries, and uh, just socially, they're not used to this country, and, and it takes a while before they know um, how, what to do and how to do it. And uh, teenagers are not uh, just like children. They can be very cool. And school can be a very, very difficult experience. Now, in those programs, do you, do you get parents involved in working with the children, too? Yes, we do. And we do a lot of role playing and theater. And we find that, that unleashing some of the creativity that kids have can be very, very helpful, either through writing. Uh, we're trying to, we're right now having a, context, a, a contest in the, in the public schools about, uh, it's called an elder in your life, trying to, to uh, have them write about the relationship between them and their elders, particularly grandparents grandparents or older relatives, uh, just to, to, to try to make them realize all the richness that is around them and the different kinds of things that they can bring to bear to their experience. And I imagine you would want to get uh, uh, in some of the communities where uh, the, uh, there are no men around because their children are born out of wedlock, you would try to get uh, more men involved in these programs, huh? We have a lot of, well, there, thank God there are, there are more male teachers uh, in the system now. We also, a lot of our programs have a lot of men. And there are also a lot of programs that are geared towards uh, teenage males that dealing with parenthood and dealing with responsibility, not because we expect them to be teenage parents, because I, you know, we, we feel very strongly that that's not the appropriate age to, to have children, but for, to start working with them towards a responsibility that, uh, you know, it's, it is, it is, uh, it's part of becoming a man, to be responsible for your children. Computer. Well, that's where you can be helpful because in the Business Leadership Council, which you have established, you have representatives of top businessmen from all over the city, different fields and professions. And what I think would be the most useful contribution you could make is to reassure our students that they should stay in college and graduate because mm -hmm. I find we have a very high dropout rate. Yeah. And uh, a lot of that happens because students have, to have responsibilities, they're, they're impatient. older, they're, they're impatient. impatient. But if, if they felt that there would be a real opportunity to get a job, I believe they would stay. And they need that reassurance from, from the business community. Well, I'm a trustee of NYU. 
And uh, one of the things that Jay Oliver and John Bradman's reform have always talked about was New York provides an education, and it also provides an opportunity for the future. Mm -hmm. And they don't get that in a college campus up in the, up in the, the boondocks. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. It's right here for them. If they're in advertising, they can get an apprenticeship in an advertising firm. If it's uh, in architecture, engineering, or in communications, or whatever it is, New York is the place. Banking, you know, it's, it's available to them. And if we provide the access to getting jobs, which it's easy enough to do. I told you that right now, they're doing it right now in these two facilities. Uh, New York is a very strong place for young people. When I came to New York City as a young man, nobody gave me a test. Nobody said, can you make it in New York? They put me down on 58th Street and, and 9th Avenue and said, uh, do the, they, I mean, I put myself down there, and, and, uh, and they said, do the best you can. Well, that's what I think New York is all about. Give it a shot, and I think that's what CUNY, which is the child of New York City, should be all about. Let's get those people in there. Let's give them a chance to do what they can. Listen, when you came to New York City, you were lucky because you could speak English. When I came, I couldn't speak yeah. English at all, so I understand the problem, but they did, especially they did. apropos of the, of the new census, which uh, now reveals that we have a huge uh, migration, more than anyone had thought of, uh, of uh, Hispanics and, uh, and Asians. Thank uh, God which, for yeah, it, yeah. because I think they're going to transform New York. New York is not a static thing. New York City is a, is a constantly changing city, and, and City University should be a constantly changing university. The aspect of City University should be constantly changing to go along with New York City, which, which is its parent. And so uh, that's why I, I'm, you know, I know we disagree when uh, you said that all the remedial should take place here rather than there. I think it's good, very good, for some of the accelerated students to be in, in the same corridors, in the same lunchrooms, in the same classrooms in some cases, as students who are not so accelerated in their coursework because we learn from each other. Students learn from each other almost as much as they learn from the teachers. And that's why we have to have this wonderful mix in City University. What would you advise us to do? I'm asking you now as chairman of the board of the City University. Um, CUNY is reestablishing its reputation very dramatically now. Um, you looked at the minority communities, the uh, African-American community, and the Latino community, Asian community, um, and really told them that they can compete effectively with the non, uh, with the white community, that uh, they can get a very serious education uh, and compete on an equal footing, and you're doing it. And well, well, here's the, the, the problem that I find. There's a fear among many uh, black and Latino leaders and people that if you have very high standards that somehow uh, they will not be able to come up to the same level as the previous immigrants. And I say that they need not fear that, that uh, what we can do at the city university is to provide the opportunity. But if they take advantage of the opportunity, they will be able to compete the same way that other immigrants did. You're absolutely right. I can just see in our hiring there is no deficit in the black community or the Latino community. They have to reach for those stars. They can't look at themselves as beneath the white community. They're not. They're absolutely not. And when you set the bar of excellence where it is, that's something that they can reach for and achieve. You're doing the right thing. I know the other argument they use is that, well, in the, uh, this is different from the old days because uh, our people have to uh, work, and they're older, and uh, yes. uh, they, they can't spend their time only going to school. But I point out that I had to work when I went to City College, and I'm sure you and have I to work. And I had to work yeah. all through um, law school. So it's not, I went to not law different at all. I went to law school for four years at night, four nights a I week. went at night, and I graduated in three years. Uh, so you're better than which I, is, I which, which is, which is it, very tough. It was hard. Yeah. I, I uh, used to get up at 4 a.m. I still do, by the way. I used I to get up yeah. at 4 a.m. to study. And if you set your mind to it, uh, you can do it. And that's what I tell 
the minority communities that I deal with. And I'm quite active with 100 black men and the coalition of 100 black women. And they're telling me that um, they see a big advancement in, uh, in City University. And uh, I would tell any youngster of any color, of any race, white, black, Latino, anybody, Asian, reach for those stars and you can do it. And City University is the place that will give you that opportunity. But start early. Start in the high schools. Start uh, valuing your education. Don't diminish yourself. What an opportunity. You can reach us by email at our website, www.cuny.tv, or write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016.